This year we celebrate the 200th anniversary of our college building, which is a landmark not just in Stevens Green, but also for many people in Dublin and Ireland and throughout the world. It is now my pleasure to tell you a little bit about number 123. Our former college medical historian J.B. Lyons adapted Francis Thompson's lines and applied them to our seats of learning. Our towns are copied fragments from our breast, and all man's Babylons strive but to impart the grandeurs of his Babylonian heart. Understandably, Lyons went on, those grandeurs are forgotten in the pursuit of day-to-day -day tasks in institutions which appear to be built of bricks and mortar, but in truth are born of ideas and draw their virtues from the men and women who serve them. On the bicentenary of this venerable building in St. Stephen's Green, it is my proud privilege as President to take you on a tour of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and to appraise you not just of the efforts, ideas and virtues of our forebears, but also to assess how the trust handed down by them is continuing to be cherished. The story of the college begins with the story of how surgery in Ireland freed itself from its medieval system of government, when surgery was grouped with barbers in the Barber Surgeons Guild. This now seemingly strange union existed from medieval times when barbers, as well as cutting hair, attended to the tonsures of monks, made wigs and also undertook bleeding and the care of less serious wounds. This association was recognised in 1446 by the Royal Charter of Henry VI, the first incorporation of medical practitioners in these islands, and continued up until the 1780s when a group of surgeons formed the Dublin Society of Surgeons and took up the challenge set by a Limerick surgeon, Sylvester O'Halloran, to establish a decent and convenient edifice in the capital for the training and examining of surgeons. They also advocated a total separation from what they termed the preposterous and disgraceful union of the surgeons of Dublin with the barbers. On the 11th of February 1784, King George III granted a charter to the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, establishing it as the sole legally recognised body representing the science and art of surgery in Ireland. The college now had a charter but no premises. It held its first meeting in the boardroom of the Rotunda Hospital and the minute book of that meeting is a prized possession of the college library. Five years after the granting of its charter, the college purchased a house at the rear of Mercer's Hospital, establishing chairs in anatomy and physiology, surgery, midwifery and surgical pharmacy. The school flourished and in 1804 a bigger premises was needed. If one were to name two men to whom the college owed its earliest prosperity, one would be Napoleon Bonaparte, whose wars increased the demand for naval and military surgeons across Europe. From 1785 to 1815, the college furnished 1,000 surgeons to those services. The second was George Rennie, a surgeon with strong political connections, who petitioned the government for the funding of a new college hall. The government, recognising the advantage of supporting a body whose schools supplied so many competent army and navy surgeons, granted the necessary funding and the college purchased a plot, a former burial ground fronting St Stephen's Green from the Society of Friends. Architect Edward Park's plans for the new building are to be seen in the portrait of George Rennie, which today hangs in the college boardroom. By 1810, the building was completed and the college now had its own premises, which included a hall, a library, museum and an anatomy theatre. The college continued to prosper, so much so that an extension was needed and completed in 1825. This was carried out by the second architect, William Murray who skillfully preserved the existing building by incorporating its Doric front into an extended façade which is what we see today. The figure of Aesculapius, Greek god of healing, 
adorns the apex of the pediment, while a carving of his head forms the keystone of the arch over the entrance. Many illustrious surgeons pass through these doors, including William Dees, one of the college founders and the first professor of surgery in Ireland. Said to be the most energetic of the founders, Dees, who reputedly was a United Irishman, took his own life on the evening of his impending arrest by severing the femoral artery in his left leg. An interesting aspect of Dees' statue in the hall is the appearance of a crack along the leg where the femoral artery is located. Another illustrious surgeon was Abraham Collis, whose name is still today associated with Collis fracture of the wrist and Collis fascia, an anatomical membrane in the pelvis. Collis held college chairs of anatomy, physiology and surgery. On his retirement, the minute book records, it is the unanimous feeling of the college that the exemplary and efficient manner in which you have filled this chair for 32 years has been a principal cause of the success and consequent high character of the School of Surgery in this country. Other notable surgeons include Arthur Jacob, who described the membrane that bears his name and contains the rods and cones in the eye, as well as the common rodent or Jacob's ulcer. An uncompromising champion of the college, he did not mince his words when he stated that, although called a college of surgeons, it is, as you all know, just as much a college of physicians. His claim was justified because in 1886 a formal link was established with the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland which led to the conjoint diploma LRCSI and LRCPI. Sir William Wilde was a dominant figure in otology and ophthalmology as well as a major contributor to the 1861 Irish census. He was a recipient of many awards, including the Order of the Polar Star from the King of Norway, after whom he named his son Oscar. Robert MacDonnell, a surgeon and Fellow of the Royal Society, performed the first human blood transfusion in Ireland in 1865. Sir Thomas Miles held the first chair in pathology in the college in 1889. This was the first chair of its kind in Ireland. Miles is also remembered as being the first surgeon to wear gloves and his steriliser was a fish kettle which stood on the stove on the kitchen fire of the old Richmond Hospital. This amazed the cook who believed he wanted just to soften the instruments. Terence John Milne, one of the most distinguished urological surgeons of the 20th century, was president of the college from 1963 to 1966. This historic building has been central to the advancement of surgery and medical education in Ireland for over 200 years. Advances that have made possible those many and varied surgical procedures that we use today represent the culmination of centuries of learning and inquiry. Past presidents, members of council, college professors and executives, people who have helped build the college into what it is today are well documented in our archives and are commemorated by the many paintings, sculptures, plaques and other fine artworks that adore the hallways and fine rooms. Each tells its own story of medical achievement reached through endeavour and perseverance. The motto of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland is Concilio Menuque, which literally translates to by counsel and by hand, but also conveys the surgeon's aspirations to wisdom and handicraft. The boardroom, which extends the entire width of the building, is where the president, vice president and council members first transacted business in 1810. This fine room with its magnificent arched ceiling has changed little since that time and continues to be used throughout the college year for conferring ceremonies, receiving dignitaries and other college receptions. From the boardroom window, looking to the right towards Stephen's Green, is a statue of Arthur Edward Guinness, Lord Ardalorn. His somewhat disdainful bearing in relation to this college may be on account of the surgeon's opposition to his wishes to open the green to the public in 1880 
to which formerly they had private and exclusive access. The boardroom has been the scene of many dramatic events in Irish history, playing its own part in the 1916 Easter Rising, when Countess Markovic, together with 150 men and 20 women, occupied the college for one week. Many shots aimed at the defenders studded the facade and came through the windows of this room, and a neat cavity still remains in the copper escutcheon of one of the doors which ended the flight of one bullet. Six days after their insurrection, Porrick Pierce wrote his acceptance of an unconditional surrender, and on the following day, the Countess, with her men and women, surrendered to Captain Henry de Courcy Wheeler, coincidentally his wife's first cousin. By a further twist, Captain de Courcy Wheeler's brother was later to become president of the college. Steeped in tradition, the college has continued to be progressive in its reach, honouring those who have had worldwide influence. An honorary fellowship is the highest award the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland can bestow on an individual for exceptional achievement. Past honorary fellows include a galaxy of international surgeons, from John Hunter to Tom Starzl, Judah Folkman and Sir Graham Teasdale, while those exceptional people from other fields include Louis Pasteur, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Mary Robinson, Bob Geldof, Jimmy Carter, poet Seamus Heaney and our current president Mary McAleese. The council room is where elected council members meet on the second Thursday of each month to discuss college business. Back in 1780, the Dublin Society of Surgeons met on Thursdays in taverns around the town, and the tradition of meetings on a Thursday continues to this day, albeit in more sober surroundings. Recent years have seen an enormous expansion in the range, number and location of college activities. In 2010, 200 years after the opening of its first hall, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland now includes schools of medicine, pharmacy and physiotherapy. In addition, the college delivers postgraduate training and education in surgery and through its faculties in dentistry, radiology, nursing and midwifery and sports and exercise medicine. It has an institute of leadership and healthcare management and a school of postgraduate studies that conducts translational research through the RCSI Research Institute. Our ability to train doctors requires hospitals and clinical resources and we enormously appreciate those many hospital facilities that are available to us in Ireland and in particular our flagship hospital, Beaumont. In return, our engagement with the health service in this country is one of total, proven and continuing commitment. From our earliest days, we have trained doctors and surgeons that have given exemplary service throughout the world. More than 60 countries are represented in our international student body, and the college is also active abroad in the provision of education, training and hospital management with schools in Penang, Malaysia and Bahrain, as well as our humanitarian programmes in Africa and other countries. The formal opening of the magnificent medical school building in Bahrain last year by President Mary McAleese was a proud day for the college, its council and its staff. The next phases of our development in Bahrain, the King Ahmed Hospital and the Health Oasis are already well underway. In 2010, I as the 167th President and the Registrar, Mr. Michael Horgan, are stepping down. The College's first female President, and indeed the first female President in all the Royal Surgical Colleges, Miss Ailish McGovern, will take office, and this is fitting as we were the first medical school in Great Britain to open its doors without let or hindrance to women as far back as 1885. Ailish and our new Registrar, Professor Carl Kelly, will lead the next and exciting chapter in the history of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. We wish them, and all associated with the college, the greatest of good fortune.